Okay. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all our honorary fellows, fellows in the house, uh, our able guests. Uh, we greet you today. We welcome you to our great event today with the Institute of Information Management and uh, International University for Information Management. We welcome you on our uh, <coughs> webinar on data privacy and potential series. Uh, my name is Alexander Anago. I'm a fellow with the Institute of Information Management, also a governing council member. Jesus Christ. Uh, it, um, we welcome you to the our great institute. So we shall commence the, the webinar shortly. Um, in no or a particular order, after my introduction speech, the, the president will take up his opening remarks. After that, we hand over to our speaker, Mr. John Montana. Um, not to take much of your time, I will call on the president of the institute uh, after this to give us uh, a brief about the institute. Again, please, if you have questions during the webinar, you may have to use the, the features to raise up your hand to ask questions. You can send your questions on the comment box, okay, to indicate your questions so that we will take your questions. And we will have pool, uh, of, we have a pool questions at the, the end of the webinar that you're going to answer. So at the end of the webinar, we will send certificates to those that are members. And for those that are not members, we will share addresses on how you can reach us to request for the slides, request for the training, then we can send that to you. So not to waste much of our time, I will hand over to the president, um, Dr. Ambassador Oyedeku. Over to you, Mr. President. Mr. President, are you here? Hello? Please, can everyone hear me? Okay, one second, Mr. President, you have to unmute your mic. Yes, we can hear you clearly, I can. Oh, thank you, John Montana. Nice to see you, thank you. Sorry, Mr. President, please, can you, is Mr. President there? It appears that he may have dropped off the call. He must be having okay. technical difficulties. Uh, okay. So we can Hello. Hear you. Yeah, we can hear you now, sir, please. We can hear you. Okay. But your line a is very clear. good evening to a very good evening to all our members in Africa, America, and across the globe. I welcome you to the June 2021 webinar. And um, we hope at the end of today's uh, webinar, we'll be able to uh, take a lot home in terms of uh, data privacy and protection, talking about the code of practice uh, for, for controllers and processors. Um, as usual, for the benefit of those that are joining us for the very first time, those that are participating for the very first time, I would like to crave your is to run through a few slides to introduce us to this um, great institute. Um, particular uh, month is data privacy and protection. And we're going to be looking at um, data protection code of practice for controllers and processors. So talking about Sorry, the President. Institute Sorry, of Information Management, we are uh, international. Yeah. Please, your line is breaking, please. Can you hear me? Your line is not too clear. I think you should turn off your, cam your camera, please. The line is not too clear. Okay. Yes, please. Thank you. All right.
Please, sir, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. We can't hear you. Your mic is still muted. Yes, I'm trying to switch to another internet. Okay, Please. all right. Sir. Hello. I hope it's better now. Yes, sir. It's better now. It's better now. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for the brief um, interlude. Uh, like I was saying, for the benefit of those that are joining us for the very first time, uh, may I use this opportunity to welcome you all to uh, the June edition of the IIM webinar. And as usual, um, we would like to uh, talk about our great institute for the benefit of those that are joining us and um, getting to know the institute for the very first time. So as a professional institute, um, we are a professional body that is developed to serve the growing community of um, professionals in different fields and sphere of um, data management. Um, as a professional institute, we serve professionals that are tasked with managing information, records, documents, contents, archives, knowledge, and so on and so forth. And um, we have the goal to ensure that we provide our members objective insights when it comes to making decisions in terms of their career paths, and also in situations where they have needs to deploy uh, solutions and technologies, you know, to solve their day-to-day -day challenges in managing data and information. So as an international professional institute, our head office is in Denver, Colorado, in the US. And um, we have chapters across the globe. Presently, the Institute of Information Management has um, chapters across the globe, in the US, in Ghana, in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in Nigeria, in France, in South Africa, in Canada, and India. So as a professional institute in Nigeria, we are duly registered with the Corporate Affairs Commission. We have the accreditation and approval from the um, Federal Ministry of Education, and we have the consent of the Attorney General of the Federation. And um, we offer professional services, which includes professional certifications. So the IIM certification program is actually um, available in two different uh, folds. We have the professional certification and we equally have the general certification. So talking about IIM professional certification, it is actually developed to serve professionals in the various fields I mentioned earlier on. And the certification program is divided or has four uh, different levels. The first three levels are referred to as the IMP levels. So IMP in our context refers to information management professional. So candidates are expected to um, completes five modules at each level. So at the completion of IMP3, uh, candidates will have completed a total of 15 modules, which will now prepare them for the final stage, which is the IIM master certification level. So at this particular point in time, candidates would have the opportunity, you know, in uh, specializing, in their choice of um, area, talking about uh, information management. Uh, they have opportunity uh, you know, to have a um, master certification in archives management, also in data management, in database management, in documents management, in geographic information system, in health information management, in information security, knowledge management, library management, 
and ultimately records and information management. So these are the available options for the IIM master certification. The other type of certification being offered by the Institute of Information Management is the GIMC certification. Like we can see on the screen, GIMC is simply an acronym for General Information Management Competence Certification. This is a general certification program developed in 2015 by the Institute of Information Management, uh, developed to bridge the information gap. Um, in the past, and even as it is happening presently, I will observe the fact that sometimes on the internet, on social media, we um, encounter certain um, confidential information belonging to individuals, belonging to organizations, belonging to governments. And you tend to wonder how this kind of information, you know, is being released haphazardly into the public. But from the research being conducted by the Institute of Information Management prior 2015, we realized the fact that um, situations like this are usually engendered as a result of the fact that in most organizations, um, there are no proper governance in terms of data and information. When you talk about managing the information life cycle, this is something that is grossly missing in most of the organizations, be it public or private. A lot of organizations are yet to begin to see data and information as corporate assets. And as a professional institute, this is part of what we are trying to promote and project. Because apart from the tangible assets available to us, like uh, um, equipment, computers, building, vehicles, furniture, and so on and so forth. Data and information equally form a very, very important corporate asset. And the need for organizations and governments, even individuals to begin to see data as corporate. So this would help organizations to ensure that they have proper information governance in place that is talking about the people having employees that are abreast of information when it comes to how they manage different information they generate in the course of their operations. It is also important for organizations to have adequate uh, processes, policies, specifications, plans, procedures, and so on, that will ensure that implementation of software and technology solutions will be able to complement and ensure that they have proper information governance in place. So the introduction of the GIMC is actually to help organizations streamline how data and information being generated in the course of their operations are properly governed and protected from unauthorized access. So the GIMC is aimed at promoting awareness in terms of information management across board. So it doesn't really matter your role in the organization, be it management position, or even as an employee, it is pertinent and important for us to have the basic skills and knowledge when it comes to how we interact with those data and information being generated. Then the GIMC would also help employees to understand the basics when it comes to how they manage data and information, and also for them to understand the roles and responsibilities they are expected to perform in making sure that information belonging to their employers and organizations are not haphazardly shared with unauthorized personnel and also to the public. So ultimately, the GIMC certification is a certification for all employees, regardless of their positions. And uh, this will help organizations to understand and imbibe global best practices when it comes to how they can mitigate against the all important information risk. Because the truth of the matter is that we all are exposed to what is referred to as information risk. The advent of technology has exposed us all to information risk. And we need to guide our data and information jealously 
by ensuring that employees are properly trained and exposed to all the skills and knowledge they need in handling sensitive data and information within the organization. So what is GIMC all about? It is um, education and certification of employees on data and information management. And um, for professionals that are core in data management and information, they will be expected to write an examination which their certification will be renewable every other three years. So uh, aside the certification, the Institute of Information Management also offers um, membership as part of the services we provide. So we have different classes of membership uh, grades, which will depend on candidates' number of years of professional experience. So membership into IIM is not only limited and restricted to professionals in the field of data and information management, because of the fact that data management is everybody's responsibility. And in our businesses, we generate data every other time. And the need for us to acquire the skills and knowledge in you know, managing all this data being generated cannot be overemphasized. So IIM membership is an all important task for every professional to ensure that they belong to this particular platform where they can share lessons learned, they can learn best practices, they can network, they can you know, um, interact with professionals across the globe and get solutions to um, different data and information management challenges they might be facing. So like you can see on the screen, we've got a number of um, uh, membership grades, depending on your num uh, the number of years of professional practices that you already have after graduation. So um, we have the students, graduates, associate professional, senior professional. Then under the fellow category, we have the honorary fellowship and professional fellowship. The honorary fellowship is um, targeted at um, top CEOs, ministers, president, governors, and other eminent personalities in, uh, in the society. While the professional fellowship is available to uh, other uh, to professionals to you know undergo the IIM continuous professional uh, programs. So the last but not the least is the corporate membership category, which is open to any corporate organization that is duly registered. So to join the Institute of Information Management is a very simple process. Um, intending candidates are expected to send the updated CV um, outlining their numbers of years of professional experience, regardless of their fields, to membership at IIM-Africa.org. So finally, as an international professional institute, we are affiliated to a number of global um, leaders in the field of data and information management. Um, like you can see on the screen, the IRMS of in the UK, PCB in Canada, information requirements also in the US, um, IAPP in the US, and so on and so forth. So um, I want to thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoyed the remaining session while I hand over back to the moderator. Thank you, and have a wonderful program. Thank you so much, uh, uh, able president, chairman, and president of the institute. Thank you so much for that uh, brief introduction about the institute of information management. Okay, I'm not to waste much of our time as the topic states is data private data data privacy and data protection series, data protection code of practice for controllers and processors. We know that today, recently, there are so many data protection regulations and laws or what we need to do, how do we imbibe on best practice in our organizations, what we need to do to get to the level of security before data protection security before compliance. So we will get to understand what are the code of processes, as this is part of the one of the courses that we have on the Institute. Not to waste more of our time, our speaker for today's events will be 
Mr. John Christian Montana. John Christian Montana is a fellow of this information management. He's also an attorney and records and information management consultant. He is the principal at the Montana Law, Denver, Colorado, USA. He's the former CEO of John Montana, of Montana and Associates Pardon Me for 21 years. He's also served as a staff lawyer and research, a researcher on information requirements. There is also a consultant on issues associated with records and information management, analysis and advice for large commercial entities on records and information management issues, including records, retention schedules, advice on legality of various information storage media, regulatory compliance litigation and discovery, and other matters likely to impact information management considerations. He has work, his work has included both analysis, critique, and, motiv and modification of practices, policies, and procedures, and retention schedules developed by others, as well as start to finish development of record retention schedules, record management practices, and procedures, alone as well as in conjunction with other records management consultants. Also, Mr. John Montana is also part of the board of the International Institute of Information Management, the International University of Information Management, his specialties are records retention, scheduling, legality of information technology, information, international information management law, information management policies and procedures. Without further waste of your time, we hereby welcome Mr. John Montana, our speaker for today. So Mr. John Montana, over to you and thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you or good evening, wherever you may be. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon and this evening. Um, I, uh, as, as has been said, we will be talking about data protection codes for controllers and uh, processors. And so we will commence. So a um, few ground rules. Uh, we will try and leave, uh, we're running a little bit late, but we will try and leave some questions and answers uh, for the end of the session, some time for the questions and answers. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, you can uh, put it in the chat function. Uh, I unfortunately cannot see the chat function at the moment, but that way it will be recorded for when the presentation is over. Uh, if you have a question uh, that may come to your mind after the presentation is concluded, uh, do please feel free to email me. This is my email address, jcmontana at yahoo.com, uh, or you can find me on LinkedIn as well. Many of you already have. So uh, as was said about me, just very briefly, I'm, I'm uh, the CEO of the Montaña Group. I am in the United States of America, where by the way, it is hotter today than it is in Lagos, Nigeria, which is, uh, I, don't, I didn't think I would ever be able to say that, but it's much hotter here than in Lagos. Um, uh, I am a practicing attorney. I have been an attorney for about 30 years and I've been in the records management information profession for about 30 years. Uh, and I have been a, a long time practitioner in the in the governance privacy space uh, and, and they've been working in privacy for many years. So this is a, a topic very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I hope you'll find it interesting. Um, so first of all, let's talk about codes of practice because we are talking about data protection codes of practice. And it's important to understand exactly what a code of practice is and is not. Um, it is not, first of all, a statute. Um, uh, they, they have legal effect and we'll talk about that, uh, but it is, it is not a statute, uh, nor is it in most cases a regulation that's been promulgated uh, pursuant to a statute. So in that sense, a code of practice is not legally binding in, in most cases, and we'll talk about the exceptions to that. Uh, that's important um, uh, be, be because uh, the question often arises, and, and it certainly arises a lot in my practice, as I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, uh, whether or not we're obligated to com comply with a code of practice. And the answer is, in many cases, but not all, the answer is no, you don't, you don't, you're not required to comply with a code of practice. There are a lot of very, very good reasons why you should comply with a code of practice. Uh, but it's important to understand that in many cases, it's not absolutely uh, obligatory that you do so. What is a code of practice? First of all, it is guidance and is intended to be guidance. Uh, oftentimes, and, and this is very, very commonly true in the privacy area, 
uh, there are a great many questions that are left unanswered by the statute and or its regulations. Um, and uh, you may need specific guidance and you may need very, very specific guidance depending on your industry and your circumstances. The code of practice is intended to provide that guidance. It is also a minimum set of standards. That's very important as well, because when you consider something like privacy compliance, the question is how much do we need to do in order to be compliant? And in, in, in privacy, particularly, that can be quite a challenge because privacy laws are often very high level and don't really give you much um, uh, understanding of exactly what you need to do. So a, a, a code of practice serves as a minimum set of, of standards that you can use uh, to implement within your organization. Uh, it's also a, a codification of good practice. Uh, wherever a, a code of practice comes from, and they come from various sources, um, it is intended to be a codification and collection of what constitutes generally accepted good practice in that industry. That's very, very important, as we'll see, because uh, that codification oftentimes has very deep legal effects. Uh, and uh, finally, it's a basis for, 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 for uh, developing a compliance program, because if you have, a, if you have a, stat, a law, for example, a privacy law, and if you have a code of practice, but you have not yet uh, developed a compliance program or you're in the process of developing a compliance program, the, the code of practice is a very good place to start because it gives you the guideposts that are necessary for you to move forward and develop the specific attributes of the program that you need in your uh, organization. And then finally, it's a standard by which your compliance can be judged and often is judged. And, and that is a very important downstream effect of, of any code of practice. It, it, uh, uh, after its promulgation, uh, it, ha it has significant legal effect regardless of whether it's binding or not uh, in your particular jurisdiction, in your particular industry. So where do they come from? Uh, you, you may have run across codes of practice, perhaps you haven't. Uh, they come from a variety of places. Um, a common place is a uh, common source of them is industry organizations. So for example, if you have um, a banking uh, organization in your country, a banking confederation, uh, or perhaps a pharmaceutical federation or something like that, uh, it is not uncommon for those organizations to decide to develop a code of practice so that everyone has a clear understanding of what constitutes good and expected practice in that uh, industry in that country. Other standards come from international organizations such as ISO, uh, the International Standards Organization, which develops codes of practice, and we'll, we'll look at one just briefly in a few minutes, uh, in order to give guidance to organizations of any kind within that particular sphere of influence. Another very common place uh, for codes of practice to arise is government regulators, such as privacy agencies. Uh, in, 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 in countries which have a well-developed privacy regime, there is always a data protection authority, which is the government agency charged with uh, uh, implementing the privacy law in that uh, country. Uh, those organizations often develop codes of practice for various industries, for various topics in order to give detailed guidance to the parties that have to comply with the law. It's important to remember that oftentimes, perhaps most of the time, these groups work together. Uh, so for example, if an industry organization proposes to develop a code of practice, they may and probably should work with the privacy regulator in that country, if there is one, in order that they develop a common understanding. This is good for the organization uh, because they get a clear understanding of what the privacy regulator expects. Uh, the privacy regulator benefits from it because the privacy regulator has significant input into the code of practice and makes sure that the code of practice meets with their expectations. And of course, uh, the end users of the code of practice benefit from this because they have a high degree of assurance that the code of practice will meet legal requirements because it's been worked out in, in uh, coordination with the regulatory agency that's going to enforce that privacy law. So, so this combination of players 
will typically work together in some form or another to develop a particular code of practice. And we'll look at a few of these. Uh, in every case, it's important to remember what the code of practice uh, is intended to do. It's intended to facilitate legal compliance. Codes of practice uh, typically show up in situations or scenarios where there is a heavy regulatory burden and uh, it's necessary to develop uh, very specific, very detailed guidance in order that uh, parties who, who need to meet that burden can have a lot of confidence that they will be able to meet that burden uh, uh, through, through compliance with the code of practice. Uh, some examples, uh, and these are just a few, uh, I, I would urge upon you that if you uh, take the trouble to uh, do a quick internet search, you'll find lots of codes of practice, uh, not only in the data privacy area, but uh, in many other areas. For example, I, I work quite a lot in the international pharmaceutical area, uh, in, in, in an area having to do with uh, quality control. And uh, there is an international pharmaceuticals organization uh, that has developed codes, uh, a, a quite extensive code of practice for good manufacturing practice in the pharmaceuticals area. And, and likewise, if you find, if you look in other areas, you'll find many other codes of practice, uh, many applicable to your industry, no matter what your industry may be. Uh, so here are a few examples. Uh, this, for example, the top one is, has developed, been developed by ISO, the International Standards Organization, and it is, it, it is relevant to each of us because uh, to the extent that you have information in the cloud, and uh, I would venture to say that most or all of us here in one form or another have information in the cloud someplace. Uh, and chances are uh, many of us or most of us, probably all of us uh, have personal information in the cloud. And so uh, this becomes very relevant to us because it is relevant to whoever our cloud provider may be in that they share the obligation that we have to protect that data. And so a, a standard on the protection of that data in a cloud computing environment becomes very important. Hence, ISO has stepped in to develop a standard. Um, here's an industry specific one. Uh, this is from the Association of Banks of Malaysia. Uh, this is a uh, code of uh, data, this is a data protection code of practice for the financial services industry in the country of Malaysia. And we'll look at this one in a little more detail later. Uh, here's one from the United Kingdom. And this is illustrative of kind of another scope in that this is not industry specific, but rather it is an employment practices code so that it governs all employers in the United Kingdom with respect to the personal information of their employees. And this is one we'll look at in some detail too, because it, uh, it is one that uh, it, it demonstrates uh, what exactly you might find in one of these things. So why should we care about a code of practice, uh, particularly if it's not mandatory? That, that's a, the, a question that often arises. And uh, it certainly comes up in my business because I am, I'm a lawyer and I give legal advice and people will ask me, well, this, this is not mandatory, why should I care about it? There are several reasons, several very, very important reasons. First of all, and we will see this when we examine a couple of these codes of practice in a little more detail, it fills a very critical and often a very large gap between what a law says and what you must actually do. So if, for example, you look at um, a, a data protection law, uh, a privacy law from, from any of a number of countries, uh, Nigeria has one that has been recently passed, but uh, if you look to Europe, for example, uh, there is the General Data Privacy Directive upon which almost other, all other privacy laws have been modeled, uh, including that of Nigeria. If you look at the General uh, Data Privacy Regulation of, of Europe, it's extremely vague and high level. Uh, so it requires you to protect personal information. It requires you to uh, not uh, keep it longer than necessary but it gives you no real detail as to exactly what you can and cannot do. So for example, uh, the, the general data privacy regulation does not tell you how long you are allowed to keep records. It does not tell you, and, and, and if, you, if you look at the previous slide, um, uh, let's see if I can flip it up here. Uh, if you look at this one, the United Kingdom data privacy uh, uh, code with respect to uh, uh, employment, uh, the, the, the GDPR, the General Data Privacy Directive, is very short on detail as to exactly what an employer can and cannot do. Matter of fact, there's no detail at all, okay? So, so this is one of the key attributes of a code of practice. 
it gives you the detail that the law that it is a, a code of practice for does not contain, but which is absolutely necessary for good compliance. Second, it is by definition a generally accepted course of action. That is what is intended to do. And if it's been promulgated by a respected industry organization uh, or by a regulator or by the two of them working in concert, it is by definition a generally accepted course of action. This is very, very important to you because when your privacy practices are judged in for example, a court proceeding, um, you will be expected to comply with generally accepted courses of action. That will be your minimum standard. So to the extent that you can point to such a minimum uh, set of standards and a generally accepted course of action, that is extremely helpful for you in a legal proceeding. And likewise, if there is such a generally accepted course of action and you do not comply with it, that is not good for you in a legal proceeding. Uh, finally, it is a shortcut. Uh, someone, uh, oftentimes some very well-respected and authoritative someones, have done a great deal of the thinking for you. They have thought through some of the more difficult problems. Uh, they have set forth explicit guidance on those problems, and they have given you advice as to what constitutes good and bad practice. They have given you advice on what uh, is necessary to be legally compliant. They have given you advice on how you can avoid risks. And oftentimes this guidance is very specific and we will see that. All of this saves you a great deal of time if you are implementing a privacy program or contemplating impl implementing a privacy program within your own organization. Uh, which brings us to something very important. And I, I, I cannot emphasize uh, this slide too much. Um, Codes of practice, although they are oftentimes not binding and do not have the force of law, are nonetheless, uh, uh, they, have, they have profound legal effects. And here is why. Uh, it, particularly in common law countries, and many of us are from common law countries, uh, but even those of you in civil law countries, uh, you, you will, a court is faced with this challenge. Uh, let us suppose that a privacy complaint is lodged against an organization. The, and, and the organization has, uh, is alleged to have committed some infraction based upon a course of action that it's chosen to undertake with respect to data. Um, the court must decide whether or not the course of action was legal and reasonable, because if it was not, then there is a cause of action and the organization will have to pay damages. Um, the court is most generally, if you take the GDPR as an example, the court is generally faced with a very vague law. And this comes up not only in the privacy area, but in all sorts of other areas where the court is faced with deciding whether or not a, a very vague or high level law has been violated by someone's course of action. Uh, how do they do that? Well, they turn to external evidence as, what, as to what constitutes acceptable practice or not acceptable practice. Uh, and in common law, this is, uh, and you will see this often in court cases in, in, in any common law country, there is something called the reasonable man standard or these days the reasonable person standard, which is to say, what would a reasonable person do in this situation? If the course of action complied with the reasonable person standard, uh, then there is no injury and therefore no uh, cause for damages. If they did not comply with the reasonable person standard, uh, then there may be a cause of action and there may be damages. Well, how do we decide what a reasonable person would do in the situation when the law itself is vague? The code of practice oftentimes is the evidence of what is reasonable. And you will see codes of practice of all kinds used in court cases all the time to, for exactly this purpose, the law, the law is vague. The question becomes, what is reasonable conduct? The code of practice becomes the evidence of that reasonable conduct. And the code of practice is introduced into evidence and becomes part of the court case. That is very common, not only in the privacy area, but in everything, uh, you know, construction, for example, is, is in another area you see it. Uh, all kinds of areas uh, uh, where a code of practice 
or a standard set of uh, accepted pra practices becomes evidence as to what a reasonable person would do and therefore whether or not a course of action was, was reasonable. Uh, also, it's worth bearing in mind that um, uh, in, in common law countries particularly, uh, when, a, when such a standard is used in court cases, uh, its use in a court case becomes part of the, of the decision law of that jurisdiction and is citable in subsequent court cases. So one of the things you commonly see is that when a code of practice has been used in a number of court cases, it, it de facto becomes law because it has been cited by so many courts that it's in effect become part of the case law of that jurisdiction. That's extremely common. So uh, bear in mind this, that uh, the code of practice, although it is not a law, it can have very deep legal effect as a result of the fact that courts do use it quite regularly. Um, and um, and this, is, th this is often done and, and be aware of this. So some things, some things to keep in mind about them at this point. First of all, uh, and, and we're going to try, I'll just take a moment here. Let's see if I can get rid of this red mark on the screen. Somebody wrote on the screen. Oh. How did we, how, um, let's just see. Oh, I think we're just going to uh, see if we can see if we can make the red mark go from the screen. Okay. All right. There we go. Uh, now we're screen sharing again. So let's continue. There we go. All right, so some things to bear in mind about codes of practice. First of all, they are not usually mandatory, uh, or at least sometimes they're not mandatory, but they may be, and you have to be aware of this. Uh, if uh, uh, an industry organization may often require its members to comply with the code of practice uh, or risk losing their membership. Uh, also, codes of practice can be adopted uh, into law in a variety of ways, um, and so, um, bear that in mind. You always have to check. Okay, uh, if it has not been incorporated into law, you can, and people quite commonly do, vary from the code of practice. Just make sure you have a, a an adequate justification for doing so. Bearing in mind what I said about the legal effects of them, um, and bear in mind that there are many, many uh, data protection codes of practice in many countries from many sources. Uh, if you look, you will find many. Uh, that's important for you because if you're looking to develop a code of practice or you do not have one in your industry, in your country, you can often look to sources in other countries and see how they've done them. And we'll look at a couple of them here in a minute and you'll see that they, they have some commonalities to them. Um, uh, bear in mind also, and this is important, if you happen to be in a jurisdiction where, or an industry in a jurisdiction where there is not currently a code of practice, uh, this is an opportunity for you because uh, a code of practice can be extremely valuable uh, and you can have a significant role in that code of practice uh, in, in the sense that uh, whoever's developing it, whether it's an industry organization, whether it's a governmental agency, whether it's a combination of the two, they typically look for a lot of input from a lot of players. Uh, that includes people within the industry, interested parties, uh, subject matter experts and others, so you can pay, play a significant role in, a, in developing a code of practice, and I would urge you to do so. Uh, uh, if for no other reason than one, it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to make connections. But number two, uh, you will find it valuable to have input into what that code says, because remember, that code will have a significant effect on your career and your professional practice. Uh, it would be helpful if you had input into, in, into exactly what's going to happen there. So uh, by all means, if you get an opportunity, uh, do uh, um, participate in the development of, of a code of practice if the opportunity comes along. So let's look at uh, this from Malaysia. We, we talked a little bit about the Malaysia banking uh, code of practice. I wanted to point out a couple of things because this is actually text from it. Uh, first of all, this one has been incorporated into law. Uh, contrary to what I said about they're not law, this one happens to be because it's been explicitly incorporated, incorporated into law uh, per, pursuant to you know, Section 25 of the Malaysia Data Protection Act. Okay? Uh, second of all, 
uh, this one has a penalty because since it's been incorporated into law, now it can be enforced against you. The data protection user uh, commits an offense if they don't comply with this and, uh, and you could be fined 100,000 ringgit uh, or even in, or imprisoned, okay? Uh, and finally, and this is important too, this kind of sums up the legal effect of these things. Compliance with the code shall be a defense against any action, prosecution or proceeding of any nature uh, based upon an alleged breach of the code. So, so this gives you the panoply of legal effects. You're bound to comply with it. You may be punished for not complying with it, but compliance with it provides you with a defense against a legal action. So bear this in mind. And if you're looking at a code of practice that happens to be applicable in your country, in your industry, you will want to look and see whether or not this is the case. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. You never can tell until you actually look. Uh, here are some other codes of practice, uh, uh, just to show you the sort of panoply of them. Um, uh, there's the international, the Federation of International Employers Data Protection Code of Practice. So this is for big international companies that employ a lot of people. Uh, the European Gaming and Betting Association Co uh, uh, Code of Gam uh, Conduct on Data Protection for Online Gambling. Uh, I, as I said, there's one for everybody. Uh, the Code of Practice for Residential Real Estate Agents of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, which has a very significant uh, data protection component. The Wadham College of the United Kingdom Data Protection Policy and Code of Practice. And the Privacy Code of Practice for the Public Service Commission of Australia. These are just a few. Uh, uh, and, this, and they're just illustrative of the point that these things come from all sorts of uh, sources and are, uh, for all kinds of specific purposes. Um, so what's in a code, code of practice? Um, if we look at one, and we will look at at least little bits of a couple of these, uh, it's a lot like a law uh, in the sense that it provides you with uh, definitions and scope and lots of detailed guidance that uh, exemplifies the, the law that it's about, whatever it may be. Uh, and it may be general guidance for everybody and it may be spe industry specific guidance for your particular uh, industry. So let's have a look at a couple of these. Now, now these are very small. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually drag over, if I may, uh, uh, a larger version of it. This is the UK, this is the, this is the table of contents of the UK employers uh, code of practice. Uh, this is illustrative and I use this one a lot in my practice because I do a lot of international work and, and uh, the, the UK comes up quite a lot as you, as you might expect. Um, the, the UK promulgated this when it was part of the EU and so uh, was subject to the General Data Privacy Direct, uh, uh, Regulation, the GDPR. Uh, this addresses the specific topic of employment data uh, within the context of the GDPR. And if you look at it, you will see, now mind you, I, having, having been reading the GDPR for the last um, uh, uh, 10 years, almost now, uh, long before it was promulgated, I can tell you that it addresses very little of the specifics of the employment situation. Uh, it, it, it admonishes you not to keep data longer than necessary and to protect it and so forth, but it doesn't really tell you what you're supposed to do. And this is a good example of a code of practice that digs into the details of this, okay? So uh, if you look at the, at the various uh, Topics. It, it, it starts with advertising and employment applications and verification, and all of the things about hiring someone uh, or the whole recruitment process. Uh, then it talks about security. It talks about uh, sickness and injury records. It talks about pension records, uh, equal opportunities, monitoring, marketing, fraud detection, uh, workers' access to their own information, discipline, grievance, and dismissal outsourcing of data processing, retention of records. This one I find very useful, this particular one, because it's a big question. Uh, monitoring of the workplace and so on and so forth. So it's an immensely detailed um, uh, uh, thing. And, and if you look, it's 96 pages long. So it's a lot of very, very detailed information that you will not find in the general data privacy directive. So for someone with UK based employees, this is a very important document because it sets forth uh, and, and this is promulgated, by the way, uh, by the, the, the UK Data Privacy Commissioner. Uh, so this is a very authoritative and very detailed piece of guidance on exactly what you should and should not be doing in the employment context with respect to employee, employee data. Uh, the next one I want to look at just briefly is, is the aforesaid uh, Malaysia uh, Data Protection uh, Code of Practice for the, the financial services industry. 
And as I said, uh, most countries, and Malaysia is one of them, have a, a, a privacy law that's modeled after the General Data Privacy Directive of Europe. Uh, and uh, you will notice that uh, the first part of this, number three, after the definitions and interpretation uh, and, and the legal formalities up front, uh, this first little part here looks a whole lot like the, uh, the uh, GDPR, and it's a recitation of the principles of, uh, of the uh, Malaysia data privacy law, which is in fact very like the GDPR in Europe. So this, it, but again, this is very high level. What you see here that, that it, it is much more helpful because everyone already knows this, or everyone already should know this at least, uh, specific in issues relevant to the banking and financial services sector. And if you look here, you'll see uh, quite a lot of topics. And if we scroll down, let's see if we can find page 33. Um, we can see that, um, um, oops, let's see if we can find that specific. Hi, Montana, topic. can you zoom your screen to 150%? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yes, let me just kind of zoom. Um, oh yeah, there's 175, that should be a little better. What you can see here is that they have taken the very high level directives of the privacy law and they have turned it into very specific bullet points about very specific topics respecting uh, the use of this information in the financial services industry, okay? And this is, this is uh, the key part in my judgment of this particular um, uh, set of guidance, because obviously if you, if you know anything about the financial services industry, uh, you handle a great deal of personal information, including sensitive personal data, uh, in, in virtually every context of your transactions with your customers. Uh, and uh, there can be a great deal of liability associated with the misuse of that data. So this section, which discusses at, at considerable length what you can and cannot do uh, with respect to personal data of your customers is very, very important. More particularly, since if you recall, uh, compliance with this guidance constitutes a legal defense uh, should you be challenged on it. So, so this section four of, of this document, which goes on for some considerable uh, length of time, as you can see, um, really and, and covers a great many uh, topics related to financial services and the marketing thereof, um, contains a great deal of guidance that is very, very important to you from a risk management perspective. So it's not just a nice thing to do. It's a, it's a critical risk management exercise to comply with this. So those are the two we wanted to look at. Give my screen a moment to refresh itself. There we go. And, and that's what we find. We find a lot of the detail that we wish was in the laws, but isn't. And, and those of you who have had occasion to, to look uh, uh, or to, to to build compliance programs related to something like the General Data Privacy Directive or some other similar privacy law will appreciate the fact that those laws are extremely vague and do not contain this kind of detail. And you will know that this kind of detail is absolutely necessary for developing a good compliance program. So this is where these codes of practice really, really uh, become a valuable tool for you. Um, what if our industry or our country has no codes of practice? Uh, that, that, that comes up quite commonly. Uh, uh, certainly in many of the countries of Europe, uh, uh, France, Germany, United Kingdom have quite extensive codes of practice, but they've, they've been at this a long time. Uh, what if you're new to the privacy game? Uh, for example, uh, Nigeria has had a privacy law for a couple of years now, but it's, it's relatively new. It takes a while for these things to arise. Uh, your country uh, may be a country that doesn't have one now and you'll have a privacy law next year and it will just show up and there'll be nothing, okay? Uh, so first of all, do you have a privacy law or do you think you might get a privacy law in the future or, or are you just concerned about privacy law such that, uh, that uh, something should be done perhaps? Uh, do you have a privacy regulator to coordinate with? 
if, 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 if you have a uh, privacy law and it's been around for a few years, chances are there's a privacy regulator, a, a data privacy authority or some such thing that you can coordinate with, but, even, but you may not. Uh, do you have an industry association? For those of you in regulated industries like uh, uh, finance, you will typically, even if you, the first two are absent, uh, you will have an industry association of some kind, uh, the National Banking Association, whatever it might be. Um, certainly, likewise, you will have good practices that can be agreed upon with respect to the management of data. Uh, if, if those have never been codified, this is an opportunity to codify them. So ideally, you would like to coordinate your industry's work with that of your local data privacy commissioner. But if there is not, you can proceed without one. Uh, and, and industry associations often do. You see many, many codes of practice that have been promulgated by industry association in the absence of a regulator or without the cooperation of a regulator just to provide clarity to their own members. If that's true, then you're in a position to begin the development of a code of practice, and you should. I would suggest that, that uh, if there is no code of uh, data privacy uh, for you to comply with, that you should consider developing one for your industry just because they're so extremely valuable and give you and your colleagues a chance to have some say so into what may ultimately turn into a legally regulated system situation if it is not already. So why should you do it based upon everything I've said? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to develop a consensus of accepted good practice. That's critically important because as we saw, the reasonable person standard is liable to show up in court should you ever be challenged uh, having a consensus and particularly codified consensus of what is accepted good practice is extremely valuable. Uh, it's an opportunity to coordinate with regulators because if there is a regulator, whether or not it's a privacy regulator, it could be, for example, the banking uh, regulatory agency of your country. If you coordinate with regulators and if you come to agreement with them on that consensus, that is extremely valuable for risk management purposes and for, and for purposes of developing a program, because not only do you and your colleagues in the banking industry, let us say, agree on what constitutes good practice, but so do the regulatory agencies that you'll have to deal with should it be a problem, okay? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to clarify what vague or high level requirements actually mean. And sooner or later, if you're gonna develop a privacy program, you will have to do that because these laws are very vague and you have to turn them into operational requirements on the ground, this is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, you can also set expectations for all the parties because it, you know, it's a great uh, public relations uh, move as well, because if you have a code of practice, everyone, and, and you publicize the code of practice, everyone involved, uh, you, the regulator, your colleagues at, at other organizations and the public know exactly what they can expect. So this is, this is a way to set expectations and also good public relations for you, your industry and your organization as well. Bottom line, um, codes of practice, uh, regardless of whether they are, are legally binding or not, are extremely valuable adjuncts to legal requirements. Always bear that in mind. They provide certainty and clarity. They provide additional detail. They fill in gaps and they help set expectations. And with that, we have actually a couple of minutes for questions. Let me stop sharing my screen and see if some questions have showed up. Um, don't have any questions at the moment. Uh, we have some requests for slides. We will make the slides available to you. Absolutely. Uh, if you have a question at the moment, uh, do feel free to type it in. Uh, if not, uh, I will, uh, I, I, as I said, I will be happy to take questions uh, after the fact. Uh, shoot me an email or reach out on LinkedIn, uh, and I will yield the floor to the moderator. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Mr. John. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, and uh, we appreciate uh, your presentation so far. It's a wonderful one, and I'm happy most of us uh, got the message. This has been a passion for me personally, for code of practice, for data protection, for controllers, and all that. So um, please, if you have any question, please, can we raise up our hands to ask questions or put a question in the chat? 
Uh, but I can't see any question here. Most of the request is for the slides. Okay, there's a question from Mr. Sunday Adesokan. He says, what is the difference between organization code of practice and organization culture? Um, th th there are a couple of key differences. Uh, an organization may have a culture, and it may be a good culture of privacy, let us say. Uh, but, but typically, the, the organization's culture is not written down any place, and it's not formalized any place. It's handed down informally from, from person to person, uh, and, and as a result, it's fluid and unchangeable. Or, or changeable, I should say, because it does change over time because it is not codified. Uh, a code of practice, and, and also there may be, because it's informal, there may be different understandings in different locations or different departments as to what it actually means. A code of practice is, is, is different in the sense that first of all, all of the key players have, have come together and arrived at a consensus as to, the, as to what constitutes good practice and, and, uh, and good uh, philosophy and good theory, but they've also written it down so that now there is a standard version of it. So, so the, 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 conceptually, the difference is that a, a code of practice is one, it's written, but as a result of that, it's much more formal because it's been developed through a formal consensus process so that everyone has a very clear understanding of exactly what's expected and there isn't the, the, the fluidity that arises in, a, in, a, in an orally transmitted culture. The question has been answered. So we have uh, someone hand raised here. Uh, we have the, Mr. Femi, Femi Daniel. This is our, our regulator. Uh, please, can you unmute your mic and ask a question, please? Mr. Femi Daniel, please. Uh, I think I should be able to unmute you. One second. One second, let me unmute you. Okay, you can unmute yourself now, please, Mr. Femi. Thank you very much, sir. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, we can hear you, please. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah. I I want to sincerely appreciate Mr. Montana, and uh, I think um, the appreciation is also being extended from the government of Nigeria and the data protection regulator. I work with the National Information Technology Development Agency, and I think one analogous thing between US and Nigeria is that while the FCC regulates privacy for now at the federal level, needs that the IT, regula IT regulator regulates data protection. I, I want to say that this, we've, uh, I mean, personally, I've taken a lot of mental notes from this. And um, we, after we issued the Nigerian Data Protection Regulation in 2019, we issued an implementation framework. From some of the things you've said, uh, apparently, we, we were going in the right direction, but we didn't just know the name. But, uh, and so there is still, uh, we've been able to cover some of the grounds, but there is a lot more. So right now we are just in the process of developing what we call toolkits for different sectors. Now, from what you've discussed tonight, I am now um, introspecting to ask, would it be better we call it code of practice or toolkits. So the idea of the um, data protection toolkit is to look at some core sectors like um, we are starting with the health sector, for example. And what we want to do is to look at all the data touch points and um, Sorry. Um Mr. Femi, your mic is muted. Mr. Femi, your mic is muted, please. Can you unmute? Oh, one second. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. But yes, let me just conclude by saying that we are, like I was saying that we are developing what we call health sector toolkit. And it's just to provide kinds of templates and um, you know, add guides for, for the, that particular sector, which is far beyond what is provided in the, in the regulation. So my question is, would this, should, 
would there still be a place for two kits like this, um, different from a code of practice? I would like Mr. Montana to please uh, kindly guide us on this. Thank you so much. And uh, we hopefully will still be reaching out to you on some of the things we are doing in Nigeria through the IIM. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. That, that is really a great question. And uh, the answer is that I think that there is room for both. Uh, because you're, you know, one of the things that often happens in the privacy area is a country passes a privacy statute and uh, people think they're done. And of course they're not because uh, the, the privacy statute inevitably leaves a great deal of uncertainty as to what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Um, and I think that uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a comprehensive level, in order to deal with the, the, the issue of privacy comprehensively, you need both of the uh, uh, things that you are developing. The code of practice, if you, if you think of this as a hierarchy, the, 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 the statute is the aspirational part of, of, of the equation. It tells you at a high level the things you should attempt to be achieving uh, based upon outcomes. You shouldn't keep information longer than necessary. You should protect it. You should, uh, you should uh, give access to it. You should obtain permission and so on and so forth. The code of practice offers detail on that uh, and, and provides you with a roadmap uh, with, with, with much more detail. But then you, you get even further down than that and, and your example of templates is an excellent uh, idea there uh, or an excellent example of how, temp how, how it might work and how such a toolkit might work. So for example, um, the code of practice might say something about providing adequate security uh, to, to uh, customer data. Uh, but that becomes an IT question. Uh, all of a sudden, the, the question arises, well, what constitutes uh, uh, an acceptable um, uh, uh, configuration of our IT system in order to, to comply with this requirement? Uh, that is when you start needing toolkits uh, in order to describe exactly the kinds of technological uh, configuration attributes you need. Uh, likewise, with the use of templates. Uh, I think templates are a wonderful idea because, for example, if they are templated documents with standard language uh, or templates for processes, uh, they describe in great, great detail exactly what you should do or exactly what you should say. So I think you're headed down exactly the right road in that you're developing two different sets of tools, which if they're done correctly, can be used for two different but complementary purposes to achieve even fuller compliance. So, so I like what you're doing very much. I, I think both the, the, the I think I, I see the, the, the code of practice as being more high level than the toolkit. And I see them both as being a very critical and important parts of a full compliance uh, program. Uh, Mr. Femi, I hope the, um, you we got the answer. But uh, like you said, um, any further information we will be discussing with you from the Institute with John Montana, because we actually have uh, what we have developed in the IIM. We have a course and we have code of practices for different sector we are working on, because we know we need to support the industry and also support the regulators in this. Um, just to add to what John Montana said, right? Sector specific toolkits will be good because there are different data elements, right? And that will help to aid faster adoption of the regulation. Okay? Um, don't correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Because we realize that different sectors, there is need for them to know what to do. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Mr. John Montana, for that. There's another question here from Chimaizu Godwin. Please, does this code of conduct cut across all industries or is it only for banking industry as showcased in the example? The answer is no. It's, it's cut across all industries, not only for banking industry. John Montana, please. I think I've answered the question on your behalf. Yeah, I, I was using banking as an example. Yeah. Um, as we saw in the slides there, that, that we I had a, several different codes of practice from several different areas. And the, the, the United Kingdom code of practice that I was using as an example is for employers in all industries. So, so financial services is an obvious example because it handles so much personal data. 
But uh, 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 certainly the United Kingdom uh, example is an example of something that, that, that uh, is cross industry. And you, could, you can have, as we, as we see from some of the examples, a code of practice for virtually any industry or for any topic uh, in a non-specific kind of way. You know, uh, employment information is one example of, uh, of, an, uh, of a data type that uh, crosses industries, but there are many others. Customer information, for example, uh, it, 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 every, every, every organization has customers of some sort. So, so regardless of whether you're gonna be industry specific or you want to develop a code of practice that is more general and applicable to multiple industries, uh, there's certainly an opportunity to create a code of practice. Uh, and certainly uh, there are example codes of practice for you to, to, to examine and see what other parties are doing. But, but the ones that I showed are just examples. Yes, um, that's correct, because those are examples. There are, you also made reference to several, the ISO code of practice for those for, for protecting personal information in the cloud. Okay, so there are other standards for code of practice that you can adopt, uh, which are, which are non-normative reference standards that we can adopt as an input for developing code of practices. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Mr. John. I think there are no other questions. And we normally have a pool question, but I think because of time, uh, Mr. President, uh, if you are there, okay. There's another yes, question from. Uh, there's I'm another question. To take that tonight. Yes, yes, please. Sir. There's another. The last question, I guess, Ma, is from Mr. David Atadia. He says, "Does stringent code of conduct information laws?" applicable to UK or US are, is also applicable in Nigeria? They are not directly applicable to Nigeria. Uh, as we've heard, Nigeria is developing its own set. Uh, I think they're extremely useful for reference, however. Let me say this, and this is why I would encourage you to look at international codes of practice. Um, uh, uh, there are a number of countries, uh, Great Britain is certainly one of them, but there are others who have been uh, developing uh, uh, regulations and codes of practice and and other such uh, aids for a number of years now. When you when you sit down to develop your own code of practice, uh, as as with uh, many other things, it's helpful to look at examples from people who have been there before you to see how they have done things and some of the things you will want to copy, some of the things you will want to avoid because uh, having in, in the, in the, in the, with the benefit of hindsight, you'll realize that there was probably a better way. So these are examples that are certainly not binding in Nigeria, unless of course you're a multinational employer, in which case uh, both of them might be applicable to you if you're a Nigerian bank doing banking, doing business in Malaysia, or if you're a Nigerian company with uh, UK employees, then they will matter to you in that sense. Um, but in any event, they're, they're good examples of how codes of practice are developed and what they've looked like. And if you're, if you're considering developing a code of practice, I would urge you to find not only these few that I have found, but others and, and look and see what other people are doing. A lot, you know, a lot of people around the world have put a great deal of thought and work into these things. And uh, you had might as well take advantage of the benefit of all their hard work when you're developing your own code of practice. Okay, uh, thank you so much, John, for answering that question. I think uh, there are no other further questions. Um, the, we'll be having the, the continuation of this uh, webinar section on the to be coming up on the fifth on the 15th of july same time next week so that um for a continuation of of this um, topic and other topics so um not to waste much of our time we want to appreciate uh, mr john montana who is a fellow of the institute of information management uh, an advisory board member and a very good friend of the institute so um we appreciate everyone uh, not to waste much of our time i would like the as if the council members that are in this um, webinar today to kindly please introduce yourselves to the house so that we can acknowledge your presence. Thank you very much. So I can see Princess, please, VP.
please, executive council members in the house, please introduce yourselves to the house. Princess Tiwiladi, I can see you, you're in the house. Well, while we wait for Princess, um, Dr. Seni, let me I can introduce see you in myself the house. because of those that are joining us or those that joined along um, shortly after we already started the program. I'm Ambassador Dr. Yiduku. I'm the President Chairman Governing Council of the Institutes. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for the introduction. Uh, please, do we have other governing council members in the house? I can see our governing council members, President Wilder, they are there. Dr. Seni, you are here. Uh, who else is here? Seni is somewhere here. Okay, um, I think uh, I've tried to unmute everyone, so I will just wait a bit, one minute, Mr. President, if I for the other executive council members to introduce themselves. Uh, otherwise, we will um, take the vote of thanks and end the session. Just to make some few announcements, we, we are the Institute of Information Management and International University for Information Management. We, we, are, we have developed various code of practices for different industries. Also, have, we have a training for it for controllers and processors, All right? So irrespective in, in of your sector, we have the code of practices developed in, because John Montana is one of us, and we are we're also working on this to ensure that we move our industry forward, especially in Nigeria and Africa. We try to try to do things to move it forward, okay? So if you have any further information or requests, you can send a mail to us. We will be sending your, uh, your certificates for your CPEs through training at imafrica.org. Like I, I've written that on the chat box, we will get across to you. We will send you your certificates for those in good standing. For those that are not members, you need to send your information as I've written on the chat box to membership at .org, Sorry so that we can enjoy the benefit of being a member of the Institute. So please, if you have our governing council members here, please kindly introduce yourself. Okay, uh, Mr. President, please over to you for the vote of thanks so that we can end the session. Thank I, you so much. I'm around, I want ah. to introduce myself, please. Princess Tiwalade, good yes. evening, ma. <laughs> Good evening, so, John. You've done a very good job. I'm proud of you. Thank you so much, Mo. Yeah, well done. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. My name is uh, Princess Tiwalade Fakonda, the Vice President One of this, our great Institute of Information Management Africa. My job as the Vice President One is to support the president and chairman of the institute to transform the mission and vision of the institute into reality in various ways. The session has been highly insightful and, and uh, interesting. I as a person have also learned from it and I can see that this audience is an amazing audience. So let's give ourselves a round of applause for being a great audience. You have all, you know, listened very well. You have all taken part so well. And together we have learned because the presentation was highly insightful, straight to the point, hopes, and very interesting. So um, John Matana, I say a big thank you to you. So once again, I thank all the council members, the chairman, the president, and of course, my dear brother, Alexandra, 
or moderating very well. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Very much, Mo. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our able VP one. Um, if we still have any other <laughs> governing council member on board, I kindly unmute and uh, introduce yourself. Uh, while we wait for that, uh, we would like to uh, request that we turn on our camera for group photograph. For those of us that would find it convenient, please turn on your camera. We would like to have our group photo before the end of the session. So executive council member that are online can seize this opportunity uh, to do their introduction, please. The president, you are speaking, but your mic is muted. And for please. those on the first screen, we actually have four dif uh, three different screens. So please let us um, uh, give us another two to five minutes for this photo session. Then we're taking the second screen now. Uh, okay, thank you everyone. We look forward to having you on board again next time. Um, July 15th to be precise, as um, we shall be um, looking into other areas in the, talking about um, this same topic, it's in a series, and uh, we'll be glad to have Mr. Montana back as usual. So till then, I want to wish you all a wonderful evening, a good afternoon to those in America and other part of the world, as we look forward to having you again on board. Thanks and remain blessed. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you, so Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's well with you all in Jesus' name. Amen.